On today's show, the Grinch's wallet grew three sizes that day. The trailer that won our hearts this weekend was Toy Story 4. Or, or was it Detective Pikachu? Interesting debate going on. Movie Talk starts right now. Quiet right, Movie Talk, first one of the week, presented by our friends at Movies Anywhere. Happy one-year birthday to Movies Anywhere. Check out the app. More on that a little bit later in the show. But right now, I am just Mark Ellis. You don't need to worry about me. That is Jeff Snyder. Over there is Perry Nemiroff. And boy, do we have a lot of news to get to today. Everybody have good weekends, good long weekends, Veterans Day. Everybody's safe here in California. I spent the okay? weekend with a veteran. I went to, to the Rams game with John Roca. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I saw him wearing an L.A. Rams shirt at the Rams game, which is interesting because he claims to be a Redskins fan, so I'm not really sure how to feel about that. I am not allowed to comment on his weekend. I was too busy watching the Eagles play this weekend because Zach Ertz crushed it! I love Perry Nemiroff and fantasy <laughs> football version there of you are you, what are you, third? I think In I'm second place? now. I, th- I think I just uh, topped Roka this week. There you go. Well, Perry Nemiroff crushing it a lot harder <laughs> than I am. In fantasy football right now, Jeff Snyder wore a New England Patriots jersey to the Rams. Seemed like the right thing to do. (laughs) Seemed like the right thing to do. Well, you guys have beaten both those teams in the Super Bowl in previous years. Well, we have a whole lot of news stories to get to. Like I said, we got some trailers, got the weekend box office, but we do kick off with the sad news of yesterday morning's passing of Stan Lee. The entertainment icon passed away at the age of 95 right here in Los Angeles, California. Stan Lee, uh, you want to talk about notable achievements. You want to talk about being an all-time great in a number of different fields, comic books, and then making his way into movies. And not just pioneering so many different storylines, so many different comic book characters. The fact that he was able to take people's differences, what some people might consider, oh, is that a weakness? Is that a strength? What is that? He made everybody individual and he made people feel special about themselves. And I'm not talking about the superheroes that he created. No, I'm talking about the people who were reading his books or who were seeing his movies he made them feel special. And that maybe is the greatest legacy of all. Stan Lee, a number of fun cameos. I mean, he made a cameo in pretty much every movie. I think I have it on good record that we will see Mr. Lee pop up in a number of upcoming films as well. Perry Nemiroff, uh, it's never easy news to digest something like an all-time great like Stanley passing away. Your thoughts on the all-timer? It's definitely not easy news, but I will say that my heart felt kind of full scrolling through all the social media accounts, whether you're talking about, you know, let's say an actor who got involved in the MCU and basically had doors open wide open because of the characters that Stanley helped create or just friends of mine who don't work in the industry at all, who met him at any random convention out there. His reach is just... I knew it was astounding when he was around, but when you just get like a little glimpse into it, just scrolling through Instagram, I mean, it really is just mind blowing what he's done. And, you know, even, even to the extent that the shirt I'm wearing right now is from, is from an Avengers uh, half marathon at Disney. It's just the characters created over at Marvel have just gone all over the place where there's movies, there's inspiration to get healthy and fit. There's characters out there who have changed people's lives because of what they mean to them and it's because of something that he kind of started or made popular with not necessarily focusing on on the hero and the hero in his suit and cape but let's say the person behind that mask and I think that was a really special touch and I also do think that's a big reason why so many of those characters are so important to many of us today. Yeah Jeff Snyder he uh, was born in Manhattan in 1922 started working at the time it was called Timely Comics uh, at the tender age of 17 then that would later evolve into Marvel Comics and we know what an influence he had there your thoughts on Stan Lee, the life. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend like I grew up reading all of these Stan Lee Marvel comic books. But it, it like, it, you know, from an industry perspective, this guy built Hollywood the way that it is currently constituted, the way that the studio system is set up. It, it is designed, you know, it's basically came right out of, out of his imagination, you know, with un, uh, universes and characters crossing over and this interconnectedness. Um, and, and, you know, outside of the Marvel movies, which obviously Stanley had had a huge uh, influence, and you know, think about even you know something like The Crow. You know, would The Crow have existed if if Stanley wasn't writing comic books, inspiring a young James O'Barr to write comics or whatever it is? Um, 
you know, I think he really showed, you know, what one man's imagination can do, how it can change the world. And I really like what Seth Rogen said uh, yesterday. And, and this is getting, you know, Seth Rogen's not in any Marvel movies. He said, thank you, Stanley, for making people who feel different realize they're special. And, and that was really Stanley's gift. The thing that, that you're self-conscious about, uh, you know, the thing that you think makes you weird or different, that is actually what makes you special. And I think Stanley did a great job of capturing that in his comics. Yeah, Perry, you mentioned, uh, you know, strolling uh, through, it, whether it's an Instagram feed or a Twitter or Facebook, what have you. So many people were lucky enough to, to take pictures. They get to spend some time with Stan Lee. Were you or Jeff either, uh, were, were you all ever lucky enough to, to meet him, to be in his presence? Uh, sadly, no. I've been in the audience when he spoke before, but I've never actually been able to go up and shake his hand and take a photo. I feel like I did uh, meet him and, sh and, sh and say hello at the Comic-Con documentary premiere. Remember that? Uh, Comic-Con documentary. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but I, I never got like a photo or anything like that. Yeah, I was on an airplane with him one time. He was first class. I was not. He uh, he got off the plane and, and we we're walking through LAX. And I, this doesn't end with me like coming up and us high fiving or anything. But I just remember seeing him and and not wanting to bother him because a lot of other people were coming up and taking pictures with him. But I remember thinking like, as much as I'm probably a social awkward person and not wanting to bother anybody, he had so many people just flooding him as soon as he got off the plane taking pictures. And he's you know at that time he was probably like 87, 88. But he just he took it all in good stride. Was just standing there all day taking pictures. There was no worried about a connection or a car to get. He, he was just happy to have fans and to, to take pictures with them. For anybody who hasn't done it yet, really go online and just browse through some of the fan pictures he had taken because, you know, I don't necessarily know exactly what was going through his mind in the moment, but every single picture to me screams, I am happy to be here with this person who really appreciates my work. And I could feel that actually looking through all of these. He's, I feel like Stanley is a guy who, who like really epitomized like paying your dues in, in an industry. Like, you know, it, he didn't, he wasn't an overnight success. Like a lot of people are these days, thanks to social media. Um, you know, he, he was a veteran. Like that was something that I didn't learn that came out, you know, on Monday, which was the day we observed veterans day. I mean, he was just, uh, he was, he was a great, a great Jew, you know, a great Jew, right, Perry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, we, we lost one of, one, one of uh, our own, um, um, and I think, but the, you know, the whole world is grieving. Uh, he, he was, he belonged to everybody. You just think about the patience that, that somebody like that needs to have because he created this incredible body of work in the field of comic books. And then knowing that this is going to work so well cinematically, but you just have to wait for, for the industry, for movies, for the technology to get to the point where you're able to pull off all these fantastic images and storylines that you would see on the page. And so for him to not be until his sixties, seventies, eighties, to really see the entire fruits of his life labors from a film standpoint it's just incredible that he still was able to have just such a cheery attitude knowing that all this was coming before anybody else did and just thinking back to you know he wanted to be an actor and ultimately one of the things in the mcu that he became most well known for something that i look forward to in all the mcu movies we see is seeing him in his cameo i mean the creativity behind some of that and the fact that we've still got more because you know it's so sad that that we've lost him but this isn't a legacy that it's like, we're not going to stop talking about away, yeah. Stan Lee. I mean, dare I say ever, ever, ever in the history of entertainment, whether it's his influence and how he's affected other creative individuals out there who want to make comic books, movies, you name it, or just being able to continue to pass on these movies, pass on these comic books. All of them are still valuable and enjoyable today. So I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, and, and there, you know, a lot of people I saw arguing about what Stan Lee created or didn't create. That that is not the time to get into that kind of stuff. I, I hate that the last few years of, of Stan Lee's life. You know, th there was a lot of legal stuff and people fighting over, uh, you know, his empire and whatnot. And I hope that his daughter, uh, you know, f sorts all that out and, and is able to preserve the, the the memory of his father and the work that he was doing. Yeah, I mean, Stan Lee, uh, like both the panelists here said, and I echo their their words, is that Stan Lee may be gone in the, the human form that we that we know, but his words, his legacy continues to live on, and one can only hope that world leaders or people that you meet on the street would start to live by the words that he wrote for characters such as Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Excelsior indeed, Mr. Lee. Well, we move on to our next story, and that is the weekend that was at the box office. Marvel movies tend to dominate the these days, but it was no Marvel movie this weekend because we don't have a Marvel movie out in theaters right now. I don't believe Ant-Man of the Wasp was the last one. So now let's get into the holiday spirit and let's talk about 
The Grinch, Dr. Seuss's The Grinch crushed at the box office to the tune of $67.6 million. Over the weekend, Bohemian Rhapsody coming in at number two, $31.2 million. At number three was the movie that seemed critically acclaimed, and it got a gaggle of fans over, but maybe not as big as some people thought it could, and that's Overlord with $10.2 million. The Nutcracker in the Four Realms just on its heels at $10.1 million, and A Star is Born, the Oscar contender, rounding out the top five at $8.1 million. Jeff Snyder, you've never been accused of being a Grinch, so why did this <laughs> Grinch do so well at the box office? Um, I mean, I think if they had a killer campaign, Illumination did a really good job with, with its outdoor campaign. Um, Especially around town in Hollywood. Yeah, the Grinch Holly- kind of LA everybody. and New York, exactly, on, on the coast. Uh, I mean, when, when was the last big animated movie? Like, I, I think it was, I guess it was Smallfoot, which, you know, performed... Wasn't a, that big. Right, exactly. It performed okay. So I think, it, you know, there was a, a built-up uh, need and desire for animated stuff, you know? Did... Wreck It Ralph, uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet missed the boat on being the first big animated movie since really The Incredibles 2 to come out, or do you think that there's plenty of room at the box office for both given yeah, that it's going to be Thanksgiving it's, It'd be the first big animated movie to hit theaters since I think it was Hotel Transylvania 3, maybe ah, in July. That was the last big, big one we had, but you know, I don't necessarily think it missed the boat. I think, if anything, it's going to stop The Grinch short, because we also have Ralph hitting theaters over Thanksgiving weekend, and that's going to bring in a boatload of money, and you know, we were talking about it last time, I think. I actually don't think Fantastic Beasts 2 is going to hurt the Grinch all that much this week, and I think it had a really, really great start. Another winner for Illumination. And I actually do think that's going to continue through this weekend. I you just think it's going to beat Fantastic Beasts? No, no, no. I or don't think it's going to beat it. You don't think it, it's going to beat it? Okay. I, I think with a movie that big hitting theaters, you would think that the Grinch's profits would, would drop pretty significantly, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I do wonder, though, if the Grinch would have been better served in December when it you know, was sort of had to take on Mary Poppins or something instead of Fantastic Beasts and then Wreck-It Ralph right on top of each December other. December is so, so crowded. Sure, it's, it's, it, it it's always too is. crowded with blockbusters right now. Listen, you're right. I mean, 67, this is a great opening for the Grinch. I don't think anybody is unhappy over there. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, a really good hold, too. I mean, that's only a 39% drop. Um, That's so incredible, I, given that's the fact that it's not else. a movie with, well, not superheroes in the way that we tend to think of superheroes, though Freddie Mercury, one could argue, pretty good, along with Queen on stage. That film, and then you have the disappointment of Girl in the Spider's Web, who, <laughs> at only $8 million, I mean, is, it, is it that? And that almost, uh, Overlord ended up beating at least Who that. called that? Who called that? Well, you did. You said it first, and then, so as I first started drafting my box office predictions, I'll start really early in the week, mm-hmm. and at number three, I had the Girl in the Spider's Web, because, you know, it was a big deal, Fetty's directing you. It's, it's a big IP. It. Yeah, you of Claire Foy starring. I'm like, this is going to be number three. It's not going to make huge money, but it's going to be number three. And then when I finally recorded my predictions, it got knocked down to four and I put Overlord above it. And then when my predictions went out, I'm like, damn, why didn't I put that at number five? And then in the end, it didn't even take number five. A Star is Born topped it. I can't believe this wasn't a top five opening at the very least for this movie. I think that's a huge disappointment. Sony botched this. I mean, I mean, it's not a terrible movie. It's not a good movie, but it's not not a terrible one um and i just thought that the campaign never found a hook like i never got what the story was like and it, and it was like this mission impossible bond type of story too uh so yeah I, I just think sony left some money on the table maybe this wasn't the right release date. maybe they should have come out with it a little bit earlier in october i felt like the marketing uh, was as deep as the movie got and so maybe it should have been more like over we're just telling you what the movie is because it was pretty much just an action adventure that i enjoyed watching but i think people were thinking maybe this is going to be too dark or twisted like a david fincher version version or like the Swedish versions were and that and Overlord it's kind of hard to tell the difference from a certain point of view because it's just a whole lot of action going on. I'm a little sad that Overlord wound up with that B cinema score because usually that's a sign of uh, not so long legs but I finally caught it this weekend it is so that movie is crazy (laughs) in the best possible ways I was so so impressed that that what they were basically able to do with you know it's not like they had an itty bitty budget but it wasn't this gigantic production and just some of the some of like the gore and the makeup effects were I, I guess some of the best I've seen all year. I really want to see it. I tried to see it this weekend, and then uh, yeah, Google Showtimes were steered me wrong. Yeah, the uh, the Rams Seahawks game happened, mm. and it was a. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
pretty good game. So check out Overlord, though. We think both Parent, I think that you will mm. like it. So a uh, movie I mean, that we all think we're going to like because we've loved the first three. That is Toy Story 4. We had the first teaser trailer for it debut over the weekend. Interesting timing because we got both that and Detective Pikachu, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the show. But Toy Story 4, that's, as Jeff Snyder would say, the IP. That's the headline, the big grabber. And there's not a whole lot to this teaser trailer. I mean, it's basically Buzz and Woody just making a cameo uh, at the end. But it was a fun trailer, and it got me swept back up in Toy Story. Perry, I still don't know if we need this movie, but I'm pretty sure even if it's not great or lives up to the Rotten Tomato score of the first three, it's going to make us feel good. At this point, if you said we needed a Toy Story 4, I would be a little concerned we for your expectations going into it. It's it's just tough. They set such a har, uh, har by. <laughs> I did a spoon <laughs> of <resume> today. Uh, <laughs> we were doing it because I was with Nana this yep. weekend, and it's like a family joke, Hi, so Nana. we were doing it, and now I've got it stuck in my Big head. Big fan but of Nana. They set the bar so high with one, two, and three that... You know, you look at something like this and, and you say to yourself, please let this live up to the, the hopes that those movies have set. And there was nothing about this teaser trailer that really, you know, confirmed that it's got a good shot of doing that to me. I was excited to see it. I love these characters. So to see them back in a piece of promo material was a lot of fun. But I didn't turn that teaser off saying, oh, they got this this time. They deserve to make a fourth. But... Then we got the thing with Key and Peele's character. Uh, Ducky and, and Bunny, respectively. That changed yeah. everything. I watched that clip with a big grin on my face, and that made me think to myself, oh, there really is more to explore with these characters in this kind of scenario. Yeah, there's going to be, if that little piece of promotional material is any factor in this, Jeff Snyder, there's going to be a lot new to introduce with Toy Story 4. Is there any way that it can live up to the first three, critically, box office, audience, any of it? I mean, yes. Uh, the, the the Toy Story trilogy is incredible. It really is, and I and I think after because Toy Story to me is the greatest animated movie ever. And those the first one, yeah, the first there. one. The first one is my favorite. A lot of people think you know Toy Story three, and some people even think Toy Story two is the best one. Um, but I, I'm always partial to the original. But you know the sequels did live up to it. You know they were worthy of that Toy Story name. So I have no reason to think that Toy Story four won't do the same like you know I'm, with most franchises i'd be inclined to think there'd be some slippage or you know something like that by the fourth installment but toy story 3 was so good who am i to to you know doubt them um, well, you're not wrong to uh, say, well, this could be the next Toy Story movie that is as good as the first three. The movie's going to hit theaters in 2019. I believe it's in the summertime. Let's check that. June 21st, 2019 for Toy Story 4. I'm not going to get Perry Nemiroff's box office prediction for that movie. Thank Just, you. Yeah. Thank Billions. you for letting me off the hook. I, I, love, I love the teaser. I thought it was a great teaser. I like okay. that it was set to J J Joni Mitchell song, mm -hmm. Both Sides Now. Um, yeah, I, it was just great to see all those characters again. Yeah, sure, it's just a teaser. It wasn't you know as exciting as, as what we may be uh, talking about later in the show, but uh, I, I thought it was a, a smart first look at that film followed right on top of it by the, the Ducky and Bunny thing. Right, well, once we get to the Detective Pikachu trail, we can debate who won yesterday morning, so to speak. I thought it was a pretty good battle between them, but without Toy Story and Jeff Snyder's favorite movies, the first one, we don't have all these other Pixar movies that we get to celebrate, like, for example, The Incredibles. Why do I bring that up? Because we wanted to remind you guys that our friends at Movies Anywhere are celebrating their first birthday today. They turn one year old in Movies Anywhere. It's a, an app you can uh, get on your computer as well. It lets you seamlessly integrate all the movies that you've purchased through places like Vudu, Prime, um, Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Microsoft Fandango. Now all those movies that you've gotten on all these different platforms can now all be consolidated in one place thanks to our friends at Movies Anywhere. Movies Anywhere, you can watch it wherever you want. You can go around. We've worked with them at Schmoes in the past too. Great people, great company, brought us donuts one day. And so we wanted to talk about some of our movie first in honor of their first birthday. And I'll kick off with The Incredibles. That was the first date movie that I went to out here in Los Angeles. Movie came out when 2000, when was it? Four? And it was, the, it was 2000 four and it was around Thanksgiving and my date wanted to go because she wanted to go see The Incredible. She thought it was like a cute movie and I wanted to go see it because it had the episode three Revenge of the Sith trailer mm -hmm. a 
attached to it. And back then, you couldn't really go online to see movie trailers like you can now, so you had to go. So we went Thursday, first showing, and enjoyed The Incredibles. Another one of my movie first, and all these movies that we're talking about available right now on Movies Anywhere, is The Waterboy. That was the first movie that I saw in college. A bunch of us, you know, you're you getting to know everybody in college, and you, you want to know what everybody's sense of humor is. If you get a bunch of college dudes around, they're probably going to love an Adam Sandler movie, especially one back in the day like The Waterboy. Bobby Boucher, Kathy Bates in there, a lot of great cameos. Henry Winkler is the befuddled coach. The Waterboy, I haven't seen it in a long time. You can catch on movies anywhere. I'm not sure if it still holds up, but that movie really crushed us college freshmen when it first came out. Oh, it holds up. That medulla (laughs) oblongata scene, did that resonate for you, the being in the classroom? (laughs) (laughs) Trying to learn about that. So those are just some of my movies first. I want to go now to my partner in crime, Jeff Snyder here. The first movie that you ever reviewed. Oh, uh, it was it was the Matrix Revolutions. Uh, if that's how I got my start writing for Ain't It Cool News. My friend was the DJ for the NYU radio station, and she would get all these invites to these super early like promo screenings and stuff. She's like, I don't want to see this, so she gave it to me. Uh, I, I saw it super early. I felt like I had something of value, so I uh, reached out to Harry Knowles at Ain't It Cool, and I said, Hey, I've seen the Matrix sequel. I wrote up a spy report, and 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 that's how I sort of got started on this path. I feel that- like I was doing all the wrong things at the NYU radio station well, why you did work I, there too i did i used to i used to you, pop on and do news briefs at the top do you know of janelle hour. janelle waltman i don't think oh, so she was the one remember. i owe my whole career to i want to hear one of these uh pair number off news briefs that you would give honestly if you gave me a little time i could probably on my like big crazy external hard drive because i'm afraid of losing anything that's mirrored a million <laughs> times over if i go on that i guarantee oh, you i could find a script the secrets okay. on that hard Bet drive you anything. Mark. Wow, yeah, we, we are. it's basically a whole bunch of super boring and NYU and even high school assignments I still have. Oh man, if you Dewey guards it. He does. The fearless <laughs> deputy that is also happens to be a cat that only Perry can hear, kind of like Pikachu, later oh on the show. Oh, my God, that um, thought. Let's get a little bit further, because this is getting very interesting now, into the, the background of the panelists here. Jeff Snyder, the first movie that you saw in theaters. Well, oh, like, like ever? Yeah. The first movie I ever saw in theaters was actually An American Tale. Remember the animated movie? Five, I right. Do Five, that. There was a sequel, Five Will Goes West. I, yeah, I must have been two years old. I, I have like the, fi- the, the faintest memories, uh, but they're in there. I remember uh, American Tale, Five Will Goes West. I remember th- thinking it was funny at the beginning because they have the one kid, or rat kid, or mouse kid, whatever the, the Five Will <laughs> family is, sing because she's so bad at singing that everybody throws fruit and vegetables at the, the house, and that's how they eat. I always thought I that mean, was really how, cool. how old, like, I, I, so I was two years old when that movie came out. Like, when do you start taking kids to the movies these days? I don't I don't have one, so I don't know. Oh, dear, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I don't... I think it just depends on whether or not they can sit through it quietly. I mean, I right, friends, yeah, that's really what it is. I have some friends that took their six-month-old to, oh, to straight out of Compton, and <laughs> she slept through the entire thing, so... <laughs> Oh. That's, you know, everybody's parenting style is different. Um, I think that, you know, I, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus into the Jeff Snyder camp, but maybe you could have been raised a little bit better, at least to be a little classier when it comes to watching movies or your viewing experience, because oh. apparently there was the first movie, and I say first, so this might have happened more often than you care to admit, the first movie that you ever tweeted in the middle of I remember okay I was at a press Aww. screening yeah of of Snow White and the Huntsman and I was just I was really angry I don't know what the hell what, what the heck I was doing there um so you busted out the phone so and I busted out and I'm like yeah I'm just having a miserable time watch this what is this movie it's ridiculous and it you know what it was it was not appropriate it was disrespectful <laughs> to the filmmakers Thanks and it got me banned from later. universal screenings for a full year whoa I was in the penalty box for a full year <laughs> I do regret that if you're gonna tweet bad things about him movie at least see the whole thing you know well i guess i did see the whole thing but you know i was in the middle so i guess i hadn't seen words of wisdom yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) lessons learned lessons learned rebanded perry let's get to some of your first before we move on um so your first horror movie they ever saw you're obviously a huge horror fan you uh co-host the witching hour with Haley fouch so you've seen a number of horror movies the first one you ever caught yeah um i i don't know if this one's available anymore but it was killer clowns from outer space i i didn't see it in the theater it was the first horror movie i ever watched with a friend though and it's you know when you have those moments and something is kind of drilled into your soul and you could specifically remember the friend, where you were sitting, what the room looked like. I've got all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then your first movie crush, everybody all has right. their yeah, yeah. Ooh, this so, should be good. movie sweetheart. As an adult, oh. 
Now, now thinking, if childhood me knew that Devin Sawa yeah, knew, followed me on Twitter, I, I think I would just melt into oh, a puddle. Wow. Because I'll tell you, if you have not seen Little Giants, you're missing out. Speaking of fantasy football, maybe that's where it all started, and I just didn't tap into my love for football until later in life, the as in a couple months ago. annexation of Puerto Rico. Yep, but that movie was Easily one of my favorite childhood movies ever. I watched it over and over and over again. Yeah, okay, it was the first movie that you cried at. I didn't just cry. I think this movie scarred me for life. I vividly remember being with my family. We all went to see a movie because we were away together for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. First, we saw The Faculty, but that's besides the point. The next <laughs> movie we saw was Stepmom with Ooh, Julia that's Roberts. A good and movie, but that's tough. Uh, there's many people out there who enjoy a good cry, and I highly recommend that movie to anybody who wants that. But if that movie is playing in a room that I am in, I will either leave the room or force them to shut it off. I like a, uh, I like a good cry at the movie. That's where I do enjoy a good cry, you know, as opposed to when I'm driving by myself in the desert in the middle of the night. That's another story. <laughs> Perry, uh, let's close up this conversation okay. on a celebration of movies anywhere. Their first birthday, first comic book movie. First comic book movie yeah, the, on the big screen was Batman Returns, and I was way too young to be watching it. And if I was too young to be watching it, my sister Lonnie was even younger, so it was even more inappropriate. Oh, but, Lonnie went too. Oh, she went. She went. I, we went with my my parents. It was it was me. It was Lonnie, and it was these two other kids who were roughly our age. I don't know what their parents were thinking either, but. I was a, a little uh, terrified of uh, Danny DeVito's Penguin for a while. Yeah, I remember there being like a huge controversy because I was like 11 or 12 when that movie came out and I went to go see it and I thought, you know, it was okay. It wasn't as good as the first one, in my opinion. But Danny DeVito, when he's, he bites somebody's nose and like yeah. blood gushes out and parents <laughs> freaked out. Like, I can't believe this isn't a PG-13 movie. I don't remember my parents freaking out, which is probably part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I vividly remember that, though. Multiple <laughs> generations of Nemiroffs encouraging blood when it comes to movies and that's probably why their daughter slash granddaughter hosts The Witching Hour right here on Collider's podcast feeds. Thank you, Movies Anywhere. Happy first birthday. And all these movies that we talked about, by the way, all these movie firsts that we're celebrating today, they're all available on Movies Anywhere right now. So check it out. Consolidate your current collection and get new movies at Movies Anywhere. Our good friends, happy first birthday. Good luck blowing out that candle. Well, our next movie that we're talking about here has not been released yet. It's not going to be released for some time. And as a matter of fact, we're still waiting on the predecessor in this series to come out because Godzilla King of the Monsters doesn't come out until May 31st, 2019. What we're talking about is, you guessed it, Godzilla versus Kong, also known as the greatest film in cinema history. Filming has officially begun on it. That's why we're talking about today. I am going to read the official synopsis because I'm very excited about this. In a time when monsters walk the earth, humanity's fight for its future sets Godzilla and Kong on a collision course that will see the two most powerful forces of nature on the planet collide in a spectacular battle for the ages. God, I'm so excited reading this. As Monarch, the company, embarks on a perilous mission into uncharted terrain and unearths clues to the Titan's origins, a human conspiracy isn't always the humans. A human conspiracy threatens to wipe the creatures, both good and bad, from the face of the earth forever. Jeff Snyder, reading that synopsis, not only did it wake me up, it also makes me think that humans are just going to ruin all this unless Godzilla and King Kong team up at the end of this movie. Uh, that would be interesting, although I'm not sure who they would take on. Um, humans? Humans, yeah, 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 whatever. Just, just get rid of us. We had we had a nice run. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm looking forward to this film. I have faith in in Adam Wingard. This is sort of like his first big budget thing. Death Note was a, a bit of a stumble for me, uh, but you know the idea of him doing a big creature feature monster movie sounds like a lot of fun. I like the cast that they've assembled here: Alexander Skarsgård, Rebecca Hall, Brian Tyree Henry, Isaac Gonzalez, Julian Dennison from Deadpool Two, and Demian Bashir, of course. Uh, and they also even said that uh, Kyle Chandler and Millie Bobby Brown are going to be coming back from the sequel. Yeah, so they're in uh, King of the Monsters, right. so you wonder who's not making out of King of the Monsters, but it does appear Kyle Chandler and Millie Bobby Brown will. Perry, do you, do you have more, I guess I'll try to spin it positive, do you have more confidence in somebody like Michael Doherty who did Trick or Treat mm. directing King of the Monsters or in Adam Wingard doing the Godzilla versus Kong sequel? It's not that I don't want to pit the two of them against each other, it's just when I look at those names, I, I honestly can't tell you I have more faith in one over the Are other. Are you talking I, about Doherty versus Wingard or yeah. Yeah. Godzilla versus King Kong. Good. Specifically, <laughs> Doherty versus Wingard. I'm, I'm really excited about the directors that they've lined up for these films, but I can't say I, I'm 
I'm excited. I'm looking forward to seeing what they could do. This franchise hasn't really hooked me, though. No. And that's even coming out of both Godzilla and Kong Skull Island saying, that's pretty good. But, but not, not just loving it, not hating it by any means, but this is just a cinematic universe that's continuing to build that isn't really pulling me in. And I think it was even more evident when I first read that synopsis. And I'm like, oh, you know, it kind of sounds like monster movies that I've seen before. This is pretty much what I would guess, especially when you say, oh, you know, evil humans are going to jump in and ruin their plan. It's like, I could have guessed that was going to happen. So I think I need to wait a little bit and see some sort of... Uh, I don't know, something pop from one of these one of these two that really gets me or, or digs the hooks in because it, right at this point in time, it's far down my cinematic universe hype list, if there's a such thing. Well, Jeff, maybe putting the, the hype aside here, do you, uh, let's spin it the other way, do you have pause or hesitation after the synopsis for... Godzilla vs. Kong that I, mean, I read. The, the synopsis is, is is five lines long, but really the synopsis is in the title. It's Godzilla vs. Kong. Yeah. Like, that's all we really need to know. Um, I think that out of these four directors, though, uh, Gareth Edwards, Jordan Fote Roberts, uh, and then Do and Doherty, I th I th Wingard is the one who does excite me the most. Um, so I I'm, I'm eager to see what he comes up with. And of course, he's not just working with one or the other. He's mm -hmm. got both of them this time around. So really, how can it go wrong? Uh, well, it can go wrong if Godzilla King of the Monsters doesn't get off to the great foot. But even that, I like. I, I was with Perry. I, I like Kong Skull Island okay. I, I thought it showed a potential, certainly with the character of Kong, if not the human characters as mm -hmm. much. But maybe the best uh, reason to get excited for Godzilla King of the Monsters and by proxy Godzilla vs. Kong isn't any of the other movies we've gotten, although I do love that first Godzilla movie. It's the trailer that they showed at Comic-Con for Godzilla King of the Monsters. Does that get either one of y'all out of bed? I did like that trailer a lot, but it couldn't compare to the promo material we got from Kong Skull Island. That had some really unique flavor to it, whereas the trailer from uh, from uh, the new Godzilla movie was, I mean, it's pretty much what you just said with the title of this movie basically spelling it out. It's Godzilla versus Kong. With that one, th the whole idea or the draw to it is, oh, it's Godzilla and we're adding these monsters that we teased at the end of, uh, of the Kong movie. So there was some inherent excitement in seeing that come to the screen, but I do miss the flavor and texture that I saw in the other trailers. All I want out of this movie is a romance between Millie Bobby Brown and Julian Dennison from Deadpool 2. That's all you want out That's of all I want. Godzilla Forget versus Godzilla vs. Kong. Kong. I just want to see Julian Dennison get the girl. Because I love that, that kid. Wears a Patriots I love that kid. shirt to a Rams-Seahawks game and tweets in the middle of movies. <laughs> so tweet Jeff Snyder right now and let him know that he should be going to see Godzilla vs. Kong for the two headliners. If you're on Twitter, you can also tweet us right now. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. Tweet us at Collider Video. We love to hear from you. At the end of every episode, we'll take a few of your live Twitter questions. Get those in the oven, and we'll get them cooking here in a second. But first, that Pokemon trailer that we all saw and fell in love with yesterday morning, Detective Pikachu. Perry, Jeff, What's going to be under the tree this holiday season? Is it going to be a little stuffed Pikachu? This is the most wonderful example of a brilliant trailer that completely changed how I felt about this particular project. I, I was like a light Pokemon player when I was a kid with my with my Game Boy, and then I played a little Pokemon Go. Go. So I'm familiar with the brand. I'm not super into it. I remember so you playing Pokemon Go. I played a lot of Pokemon mm -hmm. Go for, for that uh, particular Comic-Con <laughs> too much, but... <laughs> When I first heard about this news and first heard about Ryan Reynolds voicing Pikachu, I'm like, oh, this sounds like, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a cash grab, like it's probably not going to work out. This trailer was so delightful. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the, the relationship between uh, Pikachu and Justice Smith's character. I'm talking about the whole world where I was into the story. I liked that. But then that world that they built, it, it reminds me of when I first picked up my very first Pokemon game. And it's got that you know, where it breaks down the barriers of, oh, like if I lived in this world, I could have a cute little uh, Pokemon like that. That's the feeling that it gave me. And as the trailer continued on and I could see so many that I recognized, I started to get more and more excited until the point that it was over. And I was sad that it was over. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when this movie got announced, we were talking about it on that day's episode of Movie Talk. And Jeff, it, w it just seemed like, how do you get more than surface level with this thing? And then I had a lot of fans write me and say, no, there's a whole mythology and world built around Pokemon. And this trailer proves it. They really got deep into that world building that I think the fans would hope. So is that the most surprising aspect of the trailer? 
to you? Is it is it Detective Pikachu being able to communicate with Justice Smith? What do you got? Yeah, I, I, I kind of had like a Blade Runner vibe for me at the beginning. Um, I this was the kind of movie Perry kind of took the words right out of my mouth. This was the kind of movie I was totally prepared to ignore. And after a trailer trailer like that, I don't know that I can ignore it anymore. It really did you know make me uh, flip flop here. I don't know that I'm definitely gonna see it, but now I'm at least interested. Like I thought the trailer was really good. Justice Smith looks like a lot of fun. The the trailer was kind of giving off a Bumblebee vibe. Maybe it's the yellowness of, of Bumblebee and, and uh, Detective Pikachu, um, or just the way that Justice Smith sort of stumbles upon him and, and meets him. But uh, I thought it was really cute. It gets a little silly towards the end with all the different creatures and monsters. It kind of looks like something that I'd, I'd seen like a Power Rangers movie. No, 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 disres- Don't go there. no disrespect, Perry. <laughs> um, but no, it, it, it did do its job, which is to get me interested and excited, uh, you know, f- for this movie, at least more so than I was before. Okay, good. So everybody's seen Detective Pikachu and Toy Story 4. Which one won the internet? I knew Twitter? you were going to go there. People were debating about it. Detective Pikachu did. Did yeah. you see the thing that I tweeted out with like the that graphic where the guy's like holding hands with Toy Story 4, but he's looking at Detective Pikachu? Uh, like that was a brilliant oh, film Twitter <laughs> I wish I could come up with funny memes like that, but I can't. That's but why I, Jeff is the most it, important it, man to follow. It really, Twitter. it really didn't nail the the sentiment I felt like of film Twitter, which was prepared to write this movie off, and now can't. Perry, I I think I have to give the credit to. I can't believe I'm saying this, yeah. but to Detective Pikachu, I I'm really truly shocked right now about how excited I am. Part of it was the song, movie. honestly, because I, I, my, my first thing, speaking of first, my first concert that I ever went to was a Turtles concert. The Turtles. So oh, ha- yeah. happy together. That's them. And I think it fits great over this trailer. Okay, but the first thought, movie thought that you have when you think of happy together, so happy together is? Uh-oh. Some oh. sort of comedy. It's a comedy I'm from like the 80s or 90s. Yeah. No, I was mistaken. I was thinking Hermits, Hermits. Uh, that's from <laughs> yeah. Naked Guns. So never mind. <laughs> we can make a Detective Pikachu. Just had to reconfigure the old brain there. All right. Well, we are going to move on to your live Twitter questions. But before we do that, I do want to remind you about some of the other cool stuff we have around these Collider Studios. If you've not seen the For Your Consideration episode, they had guest Adam Driver in studio. Perry. Adam Driver here, was so cool on this desk. Pretty cool, right? It was no, it was really exciting too. Just because we're we're first getting into the phase of FYC where we're bringing in guests, we're bringing in real contenders who have a shot of scoring Oscar nominations, if not wins, uh, early next year. And it was really special to have him in. I'm a big fan of his performance in that movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, tomorrow on Collider, you can check out an all new Collider Heroes, all new Collider Live. Um, they had Ron Perlman on that show today, by the way. And I was lucky enough to guest on Collider Sports Time, hosted by John Roke and Matt Nose, me and Josh. Makuga talked about the Redskins, the uh, Steelers, all that good stuff. Living on Bell, not reporting. Check that out whenever you get a chance. And now we move on to live Twitter questions. And I put it out there, just in my in my my, my wish of wishes, my hope of hopes that somebody on Twitter would come up with the question that Satendra Banerjee, always reliable, did said, "What's your favorite Stan Lee cameo?" Huh? Favorite Stan Lee? I'm going to say it before Perry does. Uh, Mallrats. Ah, Marat is Mal clearly Rats. the best cameo. Yeah, it's not like a it's not the first funny one little oh, look. It, there's Stan Lee, like in the MCU, but this is Stan playing himself, actually dispensing real wisdom and life advice to Brody, uh, played by Jason Lee. And yeah, I just love uh, the way that Kevin Smith brings him into this movie. This might have something to do with what the line meant to me, but which Spider-Man movie is the one where he walks up to him and he says, uh, "One man can make a difference." Ooh, I it's, it's, it's that it's that one or one. two. It's the other yeah. one, maybe the one with. Nickelback. I wasn't hundred percent sure, but but that's a that's a, a pretty special line of dialogue to consider. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just go with the easy one. Say so when he played half, he's he's credited as, as himself in Iron Man, but we know he was playing. He calls him half. It's funny, but he's great. I mean, all the cameos, it's like, it's just fun being in a theater, especially like a packed Marvel theater opening weekend. Mm-hmm. And then whenever the Stanley cameo pops up, because it's not anything you go into the movie thinking like, you're like, are our heroes going to make it out? Who are they going to battle? There's going to be great fight scenes. And you always forget until it actually happens that Stanley's going to make a cameo. I also like the one that he did in the Incredible Hulk, an underrated MCU movie, because he's the guy that like drinks the super strong yeah, soda yeah. that just knocks him on a sock. The so. Big Hero 6 one is fun too, because that caught me by surprise right. for, for whatever reason. I just, you know, I knew it was a Marvel, an a Marvel cameo? thing, but um, I think he is in. It's like a mansion scene, and there's portrait pictures, and one of them is him in the background. Yeah. Cool. It was just such a nice surprise. 
All right, next up is uh, Joe Germolowitz, and he says, Hey, Collider, I saw Free Solo documentary this weekend, and he thinks it's one of the best movies of the year with 99% of Rotten Tomatoes. Why is this movie not being talked about for awards consideration? Funny thing, we were just talking about watching it yeah. because I'm pretty sure we're actually both planning on watching it before I, a certain I almost went to go see it yesterday. Um, it just got, to, like, you know, I ended up working unexpectedly yesterday because that's just the way the news broke and, uh, you know, had to do an interview. But I did, Free Solo is at the top of my list of films to see that are currently in theaters, and I want to see it on the big screen. It's one of the ones at the top of my list, but another one that was up there was a documentary called Shirkers, which I would highly recommend checking out. I believe it's actually a Netflix one, but um, Shirkers. you know, it's an, uh, an, if you have any interest in shirking, the, not, not that if you have it's any, fresh. if you have any interest in what it takes to make a movie, especially your first movie, when you've got nothing to work with it, it focuses a lot on that and it's got a, a mystery quality to it that really sucked me in. So check it out if you have the chance. Okay. Well, Dale White, I want to make Dale White feel better. He says, I don't understand your reservations about toy story four who said toy story is meant to be a trilogy. Why can't the story continue? Especially if the studio feels they have a good story to tell. <laughs> I agree with you, Dale, but it did feel like the trilogy closed itself pretty well. And then you wonder, wait, is this just a cash grab or or this and then the following up i'm not worried about it following on the story i'm sure they have a fine story but it's also like can it be as good as the first three movies that's the question because i think you can agree with me dale nobody wants a kingdom of the crystal skull situation mm. we want all four toy story movies to be great judging by early returns i think this one's going to be just fine i got a whole lot of faith but that's the way the industry works whenever you have like xyz good installment the next one is always gonna i don't know make you a little nervous Okay, well, Brian Knight is next up and last and says, in the light of the passing of Stanley and his impact on the world, says, what writer, filmmaker, comedian, etc., in the field of entertainment, I imagine, had the biggest impact on your life? Who do you got? Can I go with a tie? You can certainly go with a tie. Okay, I think I'm going to give that honor to Steven Spielberg and Wes Craven. Steven Spielberg is the one who kind of flipped the switch for me in terms of looking at a movie and not just looking at it as a piece of entertainment, but appreciating the movie magic. And then when I saw Scream for the first time, that also turned on a different part of my brain to horror movies, and it made me appreciate them in ways that I kind of never realized was even possible. And that's kind of why I'm the particular movie lover I am today. That was a much better answer than anything Jeff and I are going to come up with, right? <laughs> yeah, I can't keep just like giving out Kevin. Williamson as an answer because you know Scream made me want to be a writer or whatever so in this case I'm going to go with John Hughes uh, John Hughes you know affected an, an entire generation I, I may not have been of that generation I wasn't seeing you know his movies in the 80s in theaters but uh, as soon as I was a teenager and old enough to watch them and appreciate them you know I think that's what really helped foster my my love of movies was seeing people my own age when I you know and, and in Ferris Bueller or Breakfast Club or 16 Candles whatever it may be yeah, I mean, it, this question would be a lot easier, Brian, if, if you were asking, like, sports, because it's easy. Super Bowl 22 MVP Doug Williams probably <laughs> had the biggest impact in my life, not him. Wake Forest basketball point guard Randolph Childress. But since we're not allowed to use sports, it's tough because the comedian side of me is going to say Jim Carrey because I was, I was coming of age when his movies were out in theaters the most. And, but then you think about Eddie Murphy or Robin Williams or the Monty Python troupe, all of that stuff. But I don't think I'd have any of these, like, beliefs or maybe even getting into the more spiritual realm if not for a young man named George Lucas. So probably got to go with George Lucas because without Star Wars and the lessons that Star Wars teaches, I probably would not have made it past the age of four when I used to answer the door and proclaim that I'm Luke Skywalker in various states of undress. So George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, John Hughes, pretty good answers right now. Y'all can let us know at Collider Videos, the Twitter handle, and use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. Comment right now and let us know what you thought of today's episode, what you thought about the stories that we talked about. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And check out the Movie Talk podcast feed. You can get Movie Talk and you can get the weekend show mailbag. Not going to ask Perry on tap because we got a whole three, four days before we get to the weekend. But we are going to be back tomorrow for a very special episode of Collider Movie Talk. Why is it special? Because it's Wednesday and it's hump day and we're going to be great as we always are. Isn't that right, Jeff Snyder? Wednesdays. <laughs> Thank you very much. Not sure if you're on tomorrow. Perry, are you on tomorrow? Uh, I don't think so. Well, we'll figure all that out and get back to you. Throw it to the Y to say goodbye. For Jeff Snyder and Perry Nemiroff, I am Mary Mark Ellis. Happy first birthday, Movies Anywhere. 
Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.